Some of you may remember a movie that came out a few years back, one with Harrison Ford and Sean Connery called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Like so many before them, Indiana Jones and his father are in search of the Holy Grail, the cup Christ used during the Last Supper. They have a problem. The bad guys want it too. Because there is a belief that the cup holds healing powers. There is a scene in the movie towards the end of the story when they confront a knight who has been guarding the cup since the time of the Crusades, who is asked to tell them which cup in a room filled with cups was the cup of Christ. The knight tells them they must choose, but they must choose wisely, because just as the cup of Christ offers life, the false cups bring death. It's Indiana Jones. So the bad guys choose poorly and die, and Indy chooses wisely, and his father is healed of a life-threatening wound. In our Old Testament today, we are nearing the end of the story of Israel's wandering through the desert. Moses tells them in his farewell address that they are a redeemed people in the eyes of God. Their sins have been forgiven, and before them is the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land God promised would be theirs because they had been chosen so long ago to be a light in the world for all peoples to see, drawing them closer and closer to God. However, Moses warns them that just because or just as the promised land is before them, a land that would offer them new life, so too are many temptations. Temptations that if embraced would lead not to new life, but to death. Moses tells Israel to choose wisely. Now if this were an Indiana Jones movie, the good guys, Israel in this case, would choose wisely, and we'd have a happy ending. And scripture would not include 61 more books and letters <laughs> that tell of our continuing failure to both faithfully distinguish, discern between what is right and wrong in our lives, and to then desire instead the things of God more than the things of the world. Now in all fairness, <coughs> Right and wrong are not always so clearly labeled as such. Like the sorting hat in the Harry Potter stories, we must make judgments not just on what we see, but on the truth our heart reveals. In other words, we can't always trust our own judgment. We need help. And in this case, it is the Holy Spirit, that part of God that dwells within each of us, that will help guide us to all truth. Adam Hamilton in his book, The Creed, a book we will be basing our Lenten series on in just a couple weeks, says that while Jesus came to help all know God's forgiveness, he also came to show that the kingdom of God is not just a destination we strive to reach, but a reality in our midst. The good news Jesus proclaimed is that the kingdom of God has come to us. That's what makes his message in Sermon on the Mount so important. If the kingdom of God is in our midst, then the life we long for is attainable here and now if we choose to embrace it. However, if we hold on to our angers, our self-desires, our self-righteousness, our self-indulgements, instead of letting go of these things to embrace God's love, letting it transform our lives, 
then we still live lives apart from God, no matter how much we profess that we do not. The reason these four human traits are grouped together in today's gospel is that they all highlight the fact that living in this world without embracing the kingdom in our midst, we live in a world of broken relationships. The whole purpose of the law handed down through Moses was to enable relationships. Relationships between Israel and their God and Israel and their neighbor. At the heart of Moses' plea to Israel in today's reading was that they would choose relationship over self. In these last chapters of Deuteronomy, the last chapters of what the Jewish people know as Torah, Moses is teaching on a mountain with the fulfillment of God's promises in plain sight. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching on a mountain with the fulfillment of God's promises plainly in sight. The question is, do those who hear their words have the eyes to see what is before them, the ears to hear the truth that is guiding them, the heart to embrace the hope being offered to them? If they did, we would not have the story as it unfolds in Scripture today. And if we didn't have that, we might not know Jesus the way we do. I mean, God could have remained seated on a heavenly throne looking down on his minions, marveling at their simplicity and their awkwardness. God could have left us to fend for ourselves and then laughed at our ineptness. God could have let us journey to depths where hope might never be found. But here's the thing. While God could have done all those things, God did not. Instead, God came among us, humbling himself by taking our form, by experiencing the daily struggles we all face, by walking among us not as judge, but as friend and guide. Why? Why did God do this? Because God loves us. God loves us so much, God did not want to wait for us to come to the realization that we need God and God's help to survive. That's why God came to us. To help us know the depth of the love God has for us and then lead us back in the right relationship with God and with one another. When we fight, when we squabble over things, over ideas, over worldly events, we're not living lives that enjoy the fruits of the grace in our midst. Moses, Jesus, and even Paul in his letters tells us that the kingdom of God has come to help us move beyond our brokenness towards lives of mutual support. Lives in which we love more than hate. Lives in which we respect one another more than we do our own opinions and desires. Lives in which we see one another not as adversaries, but as brothers and sisters in Christ. The word and the grace the word extends to each and every one of us stands before us pointing pointing to the fulfillment of God's promises fulfillment that can be seen if we have the eyes to see it fulfillment that leads us if we have the ears to follow its direction Fulfillment that offers us hope if we have the strength to put out our arms to receive it. It's already here.
here. Its reality is in our midst. Our challenge is to look past all the distractions we see, to see it, and know it, and experience it in a way that brings new life here inside us. Choice is ours. We can choose from among those things that are beautiful and desirable on the outside. Or we can look to where real beauty is, where real value exists. We can look to God and choose God's ways over our own. As the knight guarding the cup said, Choose wisely. Because just as the cup of Christ offers new life, the false cups of temptation and self only bring death. Not just death to the body, but death to the soul. But know this. The good news proclaimed and revealed in and through Jesus Christ helps us to know that one poor choice does not condemn us forever. If with repentant hearts we turn back to God and strive to let God's love transform us into a people living in and of the kingdom, our past remains in the past. And we begin a new life. A life not just in and of this world, but a life of and in the world to come. Amen.